Well, welcome to the follow-up podcast. My name is Aiden. I am in the sound booth this week because we have had a slew of technical issues in the past week, so I'm going to... That I don't take responsibility for. <laughs> you said ready, it, not me, friend. Who was running the tech booth during those weeks? Um, have I have recap. no tech experience. <laughs> yes, okay. in Brian's defense, he does not have a ton of tech experience, so... I'm going to be making sure that the audio records and sounds good, and then also managing the cameras. Because last week, Brian did a phenomenal job with the audio. <laughs> Such a good job. But then I didn't uh, realize that Allison's battery died on her camera. So I messed up last week. I'll take responsibility for that. But that was a super long intro. Today, we are joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Brian Cobley, Woo-hoo! who just got done y- yesterday morning sharing his message the first week of still. Mm-hmm. What was the title of that, Brian? Be still. God is still working. And I feel bad because I didn't come up with a cool intro for Allison. But we have the <laughs> amazing, incomparable Allison the Machine Coney. Oh, well, uh, that made up for it then. The Machine. You like the Machine? Thank I, you. I do we can wish do a couple w- takes. I can do different names for you. I do wish. Allison, that you- they have no names. A Coney. <laughs> they have no names. I realize inside jokes probably aren't funny on a podcast with people oh that word. don't. I do wish that you did an alliteration. Huh? I do wish you did an alliteration. I want to be the machine, man. No, don't, sure. don't never take mind. that never from mind. me. <laughs> do not take that from, from me. me. <laughs> All right, so, <clears throat> Brian. Yes, sir. Yesterday you spoke the first week of Still. Um, before we hop into your particular message, this is great, because you and Allison were kind of the, the head um, directors or writers for this series. Mm-hmm. Maybe both of you take a, a go at it. What was the inspiration for Still? Um, I know I was in the room when you guys first started talking about it, but then you guys really <laughs> took it and ran with it, which is great because it's. I'm excited for what we're going to hear from the Still series. Now, would you like to take that, Allison? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the series is special to me because it was the first time our mini team got together to collaborate on a series for Christmas time, mm-hmm. and um, so we whiteboarded all together and listened to like, what is the Lord? speaking to each of us and what do we think would be um, rich for our, our, our flock here. And we came up with this concept that still, like being still and in a ready posture or a waiting posture is sort of how we picture Little Arbor right now. Yeah. You know, we're not making these big giant steps forward with our future. We're, we're kind of paused mm-hmm. and we're waiting and we're inclining our ear to what the Lord wants from us. And so then we started thinking about being still and how the Lord is still working on our behalf, even with that. And for, for me, my favorite part is going to be Christmas Eve, the message for that. I just thought, well, and then also I liked our, our first week in January too. Yeah. 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 I think the, I can't give too much away, but the January, series Hayden uh, actually came up with the the sticky point for that one and I was actually <clears throat> pretty mad that I didn't come up with that because it was of, out of all of them yeah it's my favorite one yeah that's coming up as well do you want to kind of feature what each week is uh yeah so uh-huh. mine last uh yesterday was still moving like God is still oh sorry sorry still working um, next week is going to be God is still moving. Christmas Eve is God is still with us. Um, and do you, do you want me to say nah, the January let's, one? Let's wait. Let's, yeah, wait let's, on let's, the January yeah, let's keep that one. one. That, one, that, one. that <laughs> one's pretty good. I'll, but, if Hayden wants to say it, no, I'll I'll, uh, I'll hold off. It when when we sat down in that meeting, I kept thinking, I'm like, is this cheesy? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I had this thought, and I'm like, it. It sounds cheesy in my head. And then I said it, and Brian, you did not give me the reaction I was looking for because I was like, oh, they hate it. And then you had said, you're like, I was upset that I didn't come up with it yeah. myself. <laughs> yeah, completely. It's, it's really but, good. Um, I don't want to hype it up too much because it's it's literally. Oh, no, it's so epic. Oh, you my should gosh. completely hype it up. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's a, I think it, it'll be great. When, when we get to really unveil it, I think it'll be, um, I think it'll go. Past this series, I think it'll be something yeah. that we probably will 
call back to for at least yes. a year. Um, yeah. And kind of, I mean, by that time, I'll say yeah. I came up with it. Exactly. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll freely give that to you. Cool. Thanks, man. Um, for a price. <laughs> yeah, for a price. Um, so we have the overview of still, kind of the conception of it, mm-hmm. where we're uh, thinking moving forward. Let's start with week one, Brian. You yes, preached yesterday, mm-hmm. um, yesterday morning, and um, just kind of give us the main point, and then we'll kind of work back from there, just kind of so we have a, a frame of reference of what this sermon was about. Yeah, so our, the sermon yesterday was about the concept of being still and how in our, in our life right now, and you know, as we're finishing up 2020, I feel like this year has just been long for everybody and... <laughs> Absolutely. At this point, it's like, what, what, what is this week going to give us? But there's, you know, there's people out there, those of you watching, who's been really affected by 2020, and it's really hard to be still. So the message was to just look at history and look at our own history to see how God is still working, and we know that he's working on us right now. So whatever it is we're going through, we can be still because we know God is going to get us through. So I, uh, I really spent time in the intertestamental period, which is the 400 years between the old Testament and the new Testament to show that, you know, we don't have a lot of scripture about that, but we know that God was still moving towards the miracle story, the birth story of Jesus. Yeah. So, question I have right off the bat. Yes, sir. When you, uh, when you and Allison started putting this series together, mm-hmm. did you know you were going to speak week one? Was that something that you wanted or was that just kind of... Yeah, actually, I, I wanted the intertestamental period. Um, to, to be honest, I've never preached it before, so I was... I think it's a message that isn't often heard, yeah. actually. I don't mm-hmm. think a lot of people even would know what that is. Yeah, I, I've never heard it preached. I've never preached it, and I wanted to do it. I wanted to teach the history because... I mean, I love, I love the Bible, um, but I love the things that you just, you don't see mm-hmm. when you just read the, the, the face of, of scripture, like mm-hmm. the stuff that's in between. That's, um, I teach that to our students. I teach that when I can up here. Um, I want to give as much context and as much history as I can to show that, I mean, this, the scripture is living and breathing. Yeah. Um, the intertestamental period is something I, I don't even know if we truly learned that much about it even at Bible college. No, not. Know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I might have been just on my laptop maybe during that. Yeah. That time. And if, if you were on your laptop, it's probably even safer <laughs> to assume I was on my laptop at that point in that class. Um, I have a question I'm going to come back to because I don't want to get to, uh, I, I want the opportunity for you and I and Allison as well to kind of nerd out on um, a little bit of the history. We talked mm-hmm. on the phone last week when you were putting this message together about Hellenization. Yes. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that, um, but oh, you, let's did wait. Did you hear it. my yes? I was excited. Like we did, yeah. we I know. Do, you're such a... <laughs> we're doing it? <laughs> yeah, so... Geeking out. <laughs> I think what would be interesting about this is tell me the reason why you went with your two verses that you went with, because you are literally using verses that are in a testamental time for your series on, or not your series, but your sermon on the intertestamental period. So I think I know the answer to this, but it's going to be pretty simple why you picked those two verses, correct? Well, mentally it was, I wanted to go to a verse that truly brings up the old and brings up the new and the, the letter in Hebrews, the author writes to a group of people who's grounded in the Old Testament. So I wanted to, I wanted to use Hebrews. I wanted to use somebody who was speaking to a whole group of people whose faith was grounded. Anytime he would bring up Old Testament quotes, like they would get it. They would completely get it. But I love that verse because it truly summarizes the New Testament and the Old Testament in one verse. God spoke to the prophets, but now these last days he's speaking to us. It was like, that's, that is the, if I wanted to tell students, yeah, that's the old, that's the new Hebrews one verses one through two does that. 
Yeah. Did you find it challenging when you knew you were going to be preaching this topic that you had extremely little scripture? To yes, I found of? it incredibly <laughs> challenging. <laughs> You, you know, know it's, of, it's, it's hard because you do have to rely on extra biblical text for yeah. a sermon like this, which for me, um, I love, I love scripture. I love using scripture. I love breaking down scripture and I have a difficult time allegorizing scripture. And so me using something and not like digging as deep as I can is actually a hard sermon for me. So this one was a hard sermon for me to write and a preach. Yeah. Um, Do you have another question? Because I, yeah, I have a sorry. question for you. you. Oh, you have a question for me? I do. I have oh, a question okay. for both of you guys. Ooh, fun. I yeah. find myself, uh, because I'm so far away and being able to make eye contact with you guys, when I'm putting together my questions, I end up pausing longer because I have no one staring at me. <laughs> when someone stares at you and you're talking, you feel a little bit of pressure, like, dude, get get it out, man. Yeah. What do you guys we'll say? fill it if you want. Yeah. No, no. Next um, time there's a pause, we'll yeah. just fill it. <laughs> uh, Brian, what was your question? Yeah, so in the sermon, I... I I had everybody stop and think of a moment in their life that they were still. And I am curious about you two of like, where did your mind take you? Cause you both were, when I said in those in the room, it's not a secret to you it's two. Us. <laughs> so, surprise, surprise. Yeah. Hayden, where, when I said be still, where um, did your mind take you to? So for me growing up in Vancouver, Washington, I assume it's kind of similar to Seattle. Like you, you don't have the guarantee of snow every year mm-hmm. in Vancouver. So I thought of all of the times in my life where you're getting a little bit later in December and as a kid you're like, is it going to snow this year? And like you're just eagerly waiting. Mm-hmm. And then um, just moments of being you know, in my, in my house and then one of the windows was open and we had, we had like a street light outside, right outside our house. So you'd be, it was really easy to see snow coming down. And I just I went back to those moments of like not running outside to go play in it, but just the... I guess the wonder and awe that I had as a kid in Southwest Washington who didn't mm-hmm. get to see a lot of snow, anytime snow was falling, it, it caused me to just stop and look at it. And um, yeah, so I think that's where I went. Different moments and it was like a little, uh, like a movie theater and behind my closed eyes of all the little memories I have. So. <laughs> Allison? I, I love snow too because I had grown up in Southern California. Yeah. It is such a treat and I never realized how silent everything is when things are covered with snow. I don't know if people just stop driving here in Seattle, but things are so quiet Uh, and the snow falling is so peaceful. So I definitely went there as well. But then I also remember every time I fly, I beg John for, you know, can I have the window? Can I have the window? Because all I want to do is just stare out (laughs) as we're soaring past, you know, like those squares of fields or like snow-capped mountains or whatever. It's so peaceful. I could just stare for hours (laughs) out the window. Which is hilarious because like I told you earlier that a plane is for some people like the most. (laughs) The last place they can relax. (laughs) They would feel still. Well, now everybody's so grumpy when you open the window because they all have their screens. Yeah. It used to be on the old days, you know, that we all had our windows open because we had papyrus to read off of, you know. And now papyrus. it's like everybody's like, turn down the, you know, close the, your little shade because the light's bothering my screen. But I, yeah, I just stare for hours outside when airplane windows. And it just gives me a feeling of stillness. And it reminded me when you said in your sermon that, your problems didn't go away, mm-hmm. right? So, like, I know when I land, real life is going to meet me there again. Yep. Mm. It, it, nothing really changed other than my um, frenetic activity yeah. on fixing the world. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, for me, uh, my mind goes to uh, a lake that my family would go to growing up. And we had a jet ski growing up. And... I remember this lake my whole life. It is like one of the choppiest lakes. It is, there's so much wind out there. There's so many boats, so many jet skis that it is just, it is choppy. And I woke up in the morning before everybody else and I jumped on my jet ski and I just went out to the middle of the lake ready to just have fun. And I stopped because I realized that I was the only person on this lake mm. and it was glass. Mm. Like I, it was so still that my jet ski wasn't even bobbing. 
Hmm. Like I was just still, and it was honestly, if you guys know me, I'm not really a calm person, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was the most calm I've ever been in my life. A calm 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Before. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> right after that, then I realized this, this isn't choppy. I can go like 60 miles an hour on this lake. So I started right. moment shred- over. <laughs> I started shredding yeah. and I destroyed the calm, but no, I do. When I, when I closed my eyes and I went back, it was being on that lake and just nobody else being there. Yeah. yeah so that was my question for you guys. I just want to know where your mind went. When you asked everyone who's listening or watching, to uh, close their eyes and, and think of a, a memory or time or place, whatever. Um, what were you What were you hoping that that would accomplish? Yeah, my hope is that it would bring you back to a place of still. Uh, like I said, uh, we are, as humans, we are mind, body, and spirit. And when one is not still, then most likely the others are as well. If you're Mentally, if you just don't feel still, then you're probably not going to sleep well and probably aren't praying that well either. Mm-hmm. So like all, all three mm-hmm. go together. And my hope was when, you, when we would close our eyes and go to that place of still, it's a reminder that still exists. Like there, a moment of everything being calm, everything tra- tra- being tranquil, that moment exists. And our problems, like, like you pointed out, our problems don't disappear it's just our problems don't dictate our mind and our body and our spirit anymore. Yeah. That we can have that moment of, gosh, I, it's not even stressing me out because yeah. I'm still. And my hope with the sermon was when we can re- remember where we've been in our history, like God's people's history, and see that God's working, then we know that whatever we have going on right now, we can be still. We can have that moment every day because God is working. Yeah. Right. And we're allowing him to do the work yeah. instead of us and trusting him rushing around trying to be all the things. Yeah. Cause I mean, as you guys know, I, you know, there's a problem. I go into quick solution. Like, mm-hmm. how can I fix this? How can I protect me? Mm-hmm. How can I protect my family? How can I protect my, my friends, my staff? Like, yeah, I, I go into immediate like logistics mm-hmm. when, when problems come up. I think actually that's a gift for some people or, you know, a skill, I don't know. Did you do strength finders? And there's activator is one of them. It's like those people who just pop into action right away. Yeah. I don't think that's one of my strengths. I think it's teaching. Uh, I think I'm an, an includer. I think that's one of mine as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I like to include people. So I guess when I stress out, I want, I want to include you. Right. In my my stress. stress. (laughs) Yeah. In your stress. (laughs) Thanks, Brian. (laughs) No, but I think I'm a, I think I'm a, a teacher a researcher and includer. I think those are my top three, but I think it's top five. I don't remember the other five are. We should ask an activator what it's like to find stillness or, you know, is that more of a challenge for, for certain personality types, Mm -hmm. um, to just, um, be intentionally slow slash stopped and allowing God space to do the work, Mm -hmm. you know, what a challenge that would be versus the sloth, you know, (laughs) type. Who oh, yeah. I, I naturally am slow and <laughs> letting God just do the heavy lifting. So, so you, do you, would you say that being still comes easy for you on the weekends? It does. I downshift. <laughs> I, I, um, follow this Instagram account called the nap ministry and they insist that napping is like an act of worship because (laughs) you are allowing you're you're slowing down to the point that you'll fall asleep in the middle of the day which um demonstrates your trust in the lord that he would continue working for you i guess it's like a mini sabbath um Mm. you know so i want to trust in the lord way more (laughs) so i embrace that you know like let's Let's take a nap now. I was a pretty good worship. worshiper from ages one to seven. <laughs> and do you think being still comes easy to you? Um, I'd say I have my moments, uh, but overall, I'd say no. Um, I have a, I have a very active mind, so even if I'm not, you know, doing anything physically, you know, like sitting or laying down, or whatever, my my brain is going a lot. So I don't have as much of an issue 
being still physically, but like mentally and, and spiritually, that's that can be a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for me, like once I'm able to check out mentally and not and not check out because I think that there obviously is an intellectual side to our faith, right? But when I'm able to slow my thoughts down, my anxieties, things like that, it's pretty easy for me to still the rest of, of myself, right? So, um, yeah, I, I'd say it, it's, uh, it's, it's easy when I really give it a, a good try, but I think that's the hardest part is really mm-hmm. sticking with it and, and continually slowing my, myself down. So. I've heard people who have, like, a sudden health crisis – like, you know, a car crash and all of a sudden you're in a body cast and you're forced into stillness. Um, what a life changing season that can be for people because they, they literally can't be the doers and making all the magic happen all the time. They have to just let others do for them and kind of hang out in their little body cast. Yeah, <laughs> Not, I mean, I, you I know, shakes your identity. Yeah. I would have such a difficult time with that. Yeah, like, we'd yeah. have to give you a lot of drugs. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Prescription. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep it clean, guys. Just come off the stage. Just PG. Make a party. <laughs> Thanks. Hayden, Hayden, Hayden's our moral compass right, on thank staff. You. Thank you, Hayden. <laughs> Parent Hayden back here. We don't want to lose our rating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nielsen will be honest about that. Um, that's super funny because the person editing this, his last name is Nielsen. But I was talking about the ratings company. The TV ratings company. Anyways, yeah, that joke didn't land. <laughs> Moving on. We thought we um, were paying you to edit this. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> that was an agreement under the old bosses. Um, so, too soon. <laughs> too soon? Um, anyways, uh, Brian. Yes, let's, sir. Let's actually talk about the research. Yes. So, is this the time that we get to talk about Hellenization? Yes, please. Oh, my gosh. So, talking about Hellenization, which is um, the force, like when, when Alexander the Great uh, rose into power, he, would, he was Hellenizing the world, which means it was kind of like just spreading the Greek culture, but it was by force. And I do believe that Alexander the Great, as much as he was doing it, was one of the kinder Hellenizers, I guess you could say, at the time. There was hmm. um, more leaders who were like, it was very forceful to, to truly get rid of the Jewish uh, religion. But one thing that really like hit me, and I never noticed this before about the, about Hellenizing and was making Greek the universal language. Now, why I think that is so cool is that prepared for an easier way to spread the gospel. Mm-hmm. Because the gospel could be spoken in mm-hmm. one language mm-hmm. for the people around. Like they would it's all cool for God to think of that. Yeah, there's there they all knew Greek. So mm-hmm. like it was prepared for Jews and Gentiles mm-hmm. to believe in the Christ. Mm-hmm. So now was like and that was if I remember the research correctly, that was in three hundred and thirty six BC. Mm-hmm. So even like three hundred years I think 300 years before Christ's death. And then beyond that, we're about 400 years removed from there to where the gospel was and the early churches were truly starting and and growing. But I'm like, wow, like 400 years in the making, there's a universal language would make the gospel easier Mm -hmm. to spread. Good attention to detail for the Lord to plan that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, obviously there's uh, a lot of negative when it comes mm-hmm. to the concept of Hellenization. But now that yeah. one I looked at like, that was fun. I wish I, I, w- I wanted to say that uh, when mm-hmm. I was preaching, but I'm like, it's a little detour. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a little, yeah. I'm happy we have the follow up to, to, mm-hmm. to bring up that concept because, you know, I don't I don't know the answer. I don't know if, you know, that was God's plan or God worked with that plan. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in the end the gospel could spread because yeah it was one language that's something that you and i talked about on the uh on the phone brian because you were pretty excited when you were learning about hellenization because mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you called me up just to talk about that or if we were already talking on the phone and you mentioned it i don't know we talk on the phone a lot we talk 
Oh, just about every day. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's kind of sad because we see each other pretty close to every I, day. As well. I, I I had to get off the phone with you yesterday actually because my wife was like, "Is that your second wife?" <laughs> I was like, "Who's that?" What? Yeah, yeah. We, t- we talk on the phone too much. Yeah. Um, but when you had called me up, I, I thought it was interesting because um, I had heard of Hellenization. And one of the things that I love is is history, and I'm very much a closeted history fan because I don't like to talk about it because mm. people think I'm a dork. But um, I don't. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, but anyways, we were talking about it, and and Hellenization is not like it's it's not unique to Alexander the Great, right? Like we even in the Bible we see that whole concept and structure of one nation coming in and conquering a whole bunch of other nations mm-hmm. and then saying, you either need to assimilate with us or you're, you're gone. You know, Either we're mm-hmm. going to kill you or you're going to become slaves, right? We saw it with Egypt. We saw it with Babylon. We saw it with yeah. even the Jews did it in the Holy Land, right? Like they went through and took out many different people groups and they claimed that for their land. And then in the New Testament, you see that's what Rome did, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just so interesting because I think that for whatever reason, and it could be, you know, uh, divine intervention that the Greek Hellenization of the Middle East was looked at favorably, whereas like you look in the New Testament, the Jews hated Rome, yeah, right? Well, they hated like, I mean, I don't know if they hated the language, you know, Latin, but like they hated so much about Rome. And I haven't actually looked into study how, you know, was was Greece and um, Alexander the Great was that a were they nicer to the people that they occupied versus Rome? Because we see that Rome was very cruel to the people that they conquered. And yeah, it, and I do believe that, you know, we if you look at the timeline, that Alexander the Great was only in power for, I think, about 10 years, maybe a little, hmm. little over yeah. 10 years, while Rome came in, you know, 63 B.C. Yep. And so by the time, you know, Jesus was in his 30s and uh in his crucifixion that was almost a hundred year rule yeah Yeah. so you know i i i don't believe alexander the great was as harsh as rome but yeah i don't know there's also way more history there um yeah with alexander or with with rome sorry yeah and and what we see is i don't want to i don't want to dog on rome because i don't know a whole lot about (laughs) rome in terms of everything else but with with Greece, it was also like a very enlightening culture, right? Like they loved philosophy mm-hmm. and like they were the forefathers of, you know, modern democracy with, with the way they did things. So there's, you hear a lot more good things come out mm-hmm. from Hellenization and Greece and, and all of those things. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know a whole lot about Rome, but I just thought it was interesting because you said that in and Hellenization is not anything new. It's been going on for, I mean, Hellenization is new, but the that whole term. The, the of, concept. Yeah, the concept yeah. of a country coming in and saying, you need to Be adopt like us. Our, yes. you know, our culture. That's been going on since probably the beginning of time, you know? Um, so, yeah, I thought that was interesting, and I, I enjoyed hearing you talk about, Hel- I don't think you really talked about it too much in your, your sermon, correct? No, I didn't know. I you just kind of really- talked about Alexander the Great. That, just just that fall. concept and spreading yeah. the Greek language is pretty much as far yeah. as I went to. One but, thing I learned that was new was your story of, um, what was the name of the guy who went into the Holy of Holies? Uh, Pompeii. Pompeii. Yes. So he goes into a holy space where the presence of the Lord is and everybody else who's gone in there, well, you're only allowed a priest well, yeah. to go in and attend the tabernacle but then everybody else just dies right and then this general or pompeii guy goes in there and nothing happens and he desecrates it i can't imagine how um upset everybody would be about that a that he didn't die and god didn't smite him and but b and so he got away with it and for anyone to come and desecrate something that's holy and sacred to you. Yeah. Oh, now, it, it was like an aha moment for me. No wonder the Jews so despised Rome, you know. Yeah, and I... For it, other I, reasons, too, but I, that. I honestly just thought of this um, 
and you know, this is this is gonna be super allegorical. But you know, I was thinking every time the Jewish people got conquered or somebody came in, like the temple was always at the target. Mm. Like that would just be the the slap in the face always. The, the temple was always the target. Now here we are mm-hmm. in our mm-hmm. the New Testament era and mm-hmm. the the waiting for the second coming, and you know the. The temple was where the spirit of the Lord lived. I know where you're going. And, and this now, is so awesome. And now we yes. are the temple. Our yes. bodies are the houses yeah. of the spirit. And how many times does this world try and destroy mm-hmm. the temple? Like we are a target mm-hmm. anytime. Like anytime the world's trying to just hide Jesus or test Jesus or test mm-hmm. our beliefs. Like mm-hmm. our temple is the target. Mm-hmm. And I, I really just thought of that. And that's awesome. I, that leads me to my second favorite part. Or I mean, I had a new learning with the Pompeii, but my one of my favorite parts of your sermon was thinking about the 400 years of silence with all those wars. Mm-hmm. And I felt for the people because at that time it would be like, if there's any time that you want to hear from the Lord, it would be in a trial or during something scary or Mm -hmm. in a time of loss. Like those are all the times where you're like pleading to hear from God. So they didn't. Right. So I felt for them for a moment. And then I thought about the comfort on this side of the cross, (laughs) the fact that we have the Holy spirit with us and that at any time things are scary or, um, you know, tragic or a time of loss. Like we have the comforter with us all the time and we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'm glad you said that because this is something I would also want to say in the sermon that I couldn't say just, you know, for the sake of time. But when you go back to that Hebrews verse Mm -hmm. uh, one through two, when the author writes that, you know, God spoke Mm -hmm. to spoke through a prophet, but these days, Mm -hmm. um, He's speaking to us through his son. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason that that is the way is because of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And in the upper room discourse, when uh, Jesus was in the upper room uh, the night before he was arrested and he was teaching his disciples all about the Holy Spirit, I think it's John 14 through 16. um, He talks about how amazing the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. is and the Holy Spirit speaks what the son will speak. Hmm. So because that we have the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, because we have the the Holy Spirit residing in us Mm -hmm. that we can hear the words Mm -hmm. of the son. So yeah, Mm -hmm. that, that Hebrews verse just reminded me of that. It's like, yeah, we do, we do have Jesus and you know, the world and the craziness of this world is trying to block out Mm -hmm. what Jesus is speaking to us and, and his, and honestly his scripture, what, yeah, written. I was going to say the second part of that is we have written scripture. Yes. You know, I mean, not only do we have one on every little hotel nightstand, yeah. you know, <laughs> we have them on our phones and on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And like, it's so, the word is so accessible to us now. Um, and like I pointed out, the the people of the intertestamental period had their, had the scrolls, had mm-hmm. God's prophecy so they had it as well but they didn't have it on their hotel no they did not i mean i don't know (laughs) you know like they had to like go and somebody would read from Mm -hmm. a common scroll to to preach or teach from you know in a in a group or it was verbal or oral tradition versus you know us i mean we're just so rich spiritually you know that we can have the written word and the holy spirit i Mm -hmm. mean we're so so well, um, I don't know, endowed with the, these gifts to be in a time of loss or transition or war or whatever. Yeah. And that time of war for them, like truly showed, and they knew he was coming. They knew the son of God was coming and it just showed them how much more they needed him. And you know, when the, the issue is the son that they were waiting for was the son of David, which was in Mm -hmm. their mind, a warrior coming to overtake Rome, because again, Mm -hmm. you you know, they just could not forgive Mm -hmm. what happened in that Holy of Holies, but they wanted Rome so far gone. And so that's why they just couldn't believe that Jesus, Mm -hmm. a man preaching love and Mm -hmm. grace Mm -hmm. was the actual Messiah. That's Mm -hmm. why, you know, should we pay to Caesar 
what is Caesar? That's why that question came up was like, mm-hmm. You know, I thought you were coming to yeah, yeah. disrupt that government, you know, yeah, which, or overthrow it. Yeah, which, man, you had to, you, Jesus had to know that this is the Messiah that they thought he was going to be. So, you know, Jesus had to know all about politics, had to know all about political okay. questions and the questions that he was going to receive. But, you know, that time in the intertestamental period just showed how much they needed Jesus, how mm-hmm. much they needed that miracle story. And what's awesome about our position is, mm-hmm. We have him. Mm-hmm. We have him. Sure, we are waiting on him to come back. To come back, yes. just like now more than ever, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Like we're waiting on him, like they were. Like yeah. we're in our own little yes intertestamental period. Yes. But you know, like like the four hundred years of of silence. Yeah, they weren't silent, and yeah. he is not silent. Yeah, he's but not. But then, si- even when he broke his silence, it was like great news. Yeah. You, you know, a child is going to be born and Mm -hmm. he's going to save us. And And angels will worship him. Yeah. I mean, how cool to break the silence with such great news. Yeah. So, but news, they just, people couldn't accept. Yeah. Hard to wrap their mind around. Yeah. Hmm. Speaking of rap, we're getting pretty close to 40 minutes. So Uh, we should probably wrap. What? 40? Did you say 40? Uh, yes, 40. Oh, oh I thought smokes. you, when you were speaking of rap, I thought you were going to have us do uh, Snoop Dogg <laughs> and Dr. Battle. Dre. And yeah, yeah. If or you guys, order in some raps for us. I think the listeners would be okay with going a little bit over if you guys wanted to have a rap battle. Do, do you want to do what we did before? See if... Uh... This is my Alzheimer's test. <laughs> oh, no. Are you, are you, are you ready? I can try it. Just all a right, couple. All right, you got you to you, you gotta repeat after me. We'll just do Brian, the one. Can you do one favor for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that we're going to want to be able to keep cool, cool. Allison's audio for the future, like just to be able to like play it back and listen yeah. to this. Yeah, Please don't say anything to your mic when she's going for it. When I she's just, doing it? Okay. I want to have pristine audio <laughs> okay. that we can put on a loop of Allison just rapping. All right. Are you ready, Allison? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so bad at this. Here we go. One, two, three into the four. Snoop Dogg and Dogg and Dr. Dre at your dough. One, two, three and four and four. <laughs> Snoop and Dr. Dre knocking down my door. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I feel like it's an Alzheimer's so test. <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> thank you so much, Allison. Can't follow. <laughs> um, that was, that, can that just be our intro to every follow-up, please? I'll see, yeah, I'll see what you we know, can do No, no, no. I've got the rights to that. That's <laughs> enough. <laughs> that is technically copyrighted material, so. <laughs> um what I was going to say on wrapping things up before we got into a rap battle, um, <laughs> a white person rap battle, <laughs> um, Brian. Yes, sir. You spoke this week. Next week we have Scott Hetherington. Yep. Um, do you have, do you have a kind of a framework what we're expecting next week from yep. Scott? Uh, it's going to be that God is still moving and uh, Scott's going to be moving us closer to that miracle story, the birth of Jesus, the birth of the Messiah. Yeah. So, if you were uh, now ready for the Christmassy part of the <laughs> Christmas series, next yeah. week would be a good one. Yes, I don't know. I don't know much about his sermon, but I am just so excited to have Scott back on the podcast because that was maybe <laughs> one of the more fun podcasts we had. No, this one had. is. What? This what are you one. saying, Hayden? Yeah, this, this, what are you saying? This one's the best. <laughs> no, this one's. This has been a really good podcast, guys. It's been really cool. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for when Scott joins us next week and um, anything else you guys want to share before we close things out? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> no. It's pretty silent. Um, silent period. <laughs> but umch. So, uh, thank you so much for watching the follow-up podcast or listening to it and um, we hope to see you guys next week. Bye.